be listening to the recording, but thank you, thank you so much for all of you guys who who joined joined us tonight. We have so many questions to go over. Um, there were a lot of questions, and even uh, the survey link that I sent out this morning, several people asked questions in there that I added to the Q and A. So if I start talking too fast, somebody needs to slow me down. Um, but I was, I kind of took a step back and I was thinking about the, the process that we're walking through in this entire course and our five goals that I have for everyone in this course. And I thought I'd kind of start off the Q&A by kind of going over those. And um, and then dive into the dive into the questions. Um, my, the first goal is to help people get a stronger business structure, which is what we've been talking about in modules one and two. Module one was all about you know your personal um, personal self awareness and the structure of that, and then module two is all about um, just basic traditional business structures, but it, it's not something that's taught in school or even in e-courses, so it's important for us to cover it. And I know it's definitely new information for some people, or it can help you figure out um, where you are. We'll get more into that um, in the in the Q&A. A lot of people ask some great questions about that. But if you have a stronger structure, that leads to the second goal I have for everyone, which is more organized systems. And I'm constantly, personally, always, trying to better organize my business systems, operations, processes, things like that. And so we'll start talking about that more in depth in the next module and then and then kind of finish out um, the next um, next modules with just different ways you can do different things. We're gonna be starting to talk about a lot of um, techniques um, for each of the seven systems and then uh, you're gonna start making to-do lists, I think, for things that you need to do. And if we get organized systems in place for our businesses, that leads to the third goal that we should all have as a business, and that is better customer service, a more consistent client experience, stronger brand, few, and fewer advertising expenses. Um, that would actually be a goal I have for everyone in this course. I'm not big on paying for advertising. And we're going to talk more about that in, um, in some later modules. You'll kind of start to see why. And then if we get all that in place, that leads to the fourth goal I would have for everyone, which is more customers or better customers, not necessarily both. Um, you may be in a situation with your business where you need more customers. You actually just need to get more people in the door to buy more. But it's sort of a paradigm shift to think, well, what if I don't need more customers? What if I need better customers? What if I need customers that value my brand more so that I can charge a more premium price. And we'll talk about branding in module four, uh, five. And then the final goal I have for everybody would be that if you, if you have more customers or better customers, that's going to lead to the ultimate goal of any business, which is more revenue or more profit margin or both. And again, um, not every business is necessarily going to just want more revenue. Some businesses are going to say, I'll take less revenue with a higher profit margin. And some businesses are going to say, I want both, um, depending on um, the choices that, that you feel like are right for your business. But any of those, combination of those three, three things would lead us to increase sales. So that's kind of the process that we're they're walking through. right now just a sort of an overview it's not necessarily module by module but that's the that's the road I'm I'm trying to take you guys down um, so the I'll just dive into the the first question and if you guys have um, I've made a lot of notes on this um, about my so if you guys have any other questions you're happy you're welcome to type them in the chat box and I'll do my best to, to get um, we'll start off with question number one. These are in no particular order. Um, someone says you mentioned Shopify in lesson three. 
for someone just starting in retail, would I recommend launching a Shopify site or starting with Etsy? And my recommendation is start with Etsy or start with whatever is free. Spend as little money at first as possible while you are in the demand for your product, the response to your brand, and your ability to sustain a long-term interest in operating a business. And those three things are um, essential. Um, anybody that's starting out or anybody that's stuck and can't figure out why their business isn't growing to a certain point, um, if you and I were sitting down to coffee and talking one-on-one, -on -one, I would say, let's talk about the demand for your product. Let's talk about how people are connecting with your brand. And let's talk about how interested you are in continuing to run this business. Um, because if, if you don't get excited about it, it's hard for other people to get excited about it as well. It's hard to, to translate that excitement. It's going to make them want to purchase uh, your product or offering. Um, okay, question number two is, my entrepreneurial style is production artist, and I am torn between two of the archetypes, maker and freelancer. My business is currently 100% service-based as I offer art for weddings, events, and then also product collaboration. I love creating and finding ways my art for the benefit of launching my own e-commerce site in the near future. I am passionate about the details like a maker, and I also love the independence that freelancing has provided. Can I be both, or to have a truly successful business, do I have to choose just one? No, you definitely do not have to choose just one. That's my answer to that. Um, the reason we put the archetypes in the grid format was so that we could communicate most easily um, how different businesses can operate. Um, but in the real world, many businesses take a hybrid approach to what they sell and what they offer. So there are a lot of businesses out there that offer physical products and services or information products and physical products. Um, so you're probably going to have hybrids out there. Um, now I will talk later on in this Q&A about what you running two businesses and, and that's, I do have some red flags. Um, I, I think we have a lot of people, I mean, just as, as, Creative entrepreneurs, I think we get very interested in running lots of businesses. Um, I personally like to say I love starting. I really get fired up and excited about starting something new, and so you guys might as well. I think it's totally fine to sell um, different channels of products, um, but um, we'll talk about multiple businesses here in a second. Okay, next question. Can a freelancer sell physical products as part of his or her business model or must it only, must it only be service-based? So similar to the last answer, I just wanted to make sure I answered every question somebody asked. A freelancer could supplement their income with products, absolutely. Uh, okay, next question. You talked about killing products that aren't working or selling. What is the best way to do that? And, and I, yeah, wholeheartedly. And um, I, I really believe that you have to kill what's not working. There, and there is no easy way to do that. Um, to relate from my personal experience in my last business, we had, we had so many SKUs um, and they were in a product called Albums. And, and the business model was that uh, we were a wholesaler and retailers would buy these albums from us at cost. So we didn't make any money when we sold them the albums. When we sold them the albums, we were anticipating that they would place orders from the albums, and um, that that's where our revenue would come from. Um, happening with the albums was the retailers weren't using them. So we ended up in a position where we needed to go through all of our SKU lists and, and to simply take everything that wasn't selling and delete it from our product database. We couldn't do that though because we had sold retailers these albums and they had they had they had invested in these albums um, and we needed to honor that investment. So it was it was a very tough situation and it was very hard to to kill this use. In hindsight, um, 
and there were somebody actually said one of the questions was I would love it if Whitney would give us a behind the scenes of her of her business, both her last business and her current business. I will do that. I'll do that at the end of the course um, as a bonus. I'm happy to jump on a webinar and answer any questions. Um, but it was really hard for us to kill those SKUs. But in hindsight, um, had the company been um, financially sustainable, we would have had to find a way. I mean, 16,000 SKUs was too many, especially when what we sold was probably 20%, and there were probably another 50% of it that never even got ordered every single year. The statistics on it were staggering. Um, so another little thought and uh, piece of advice I have about killing products is prepare yourself for people to not be happy. If you eliminate products, um, if you eliminate services, there are always going to be people that don't understand. Um, there are going to be friends and family that are proud of you, that are going to say, um, you had such a great business doing that. Why'd you, why did you let it go? Um, but if you, and, and everyone will always have an opinion about what you what they think you should do i mean who who feels like that who feels like as a creative entrepreneur you tell your friends and family you're doing something and all of a sudden they come out of the woodwork like you should do this you should do that all of a sudden everybody has ideas um about how you should run your business i love it i've learned over the years to just really genuinely look at these people and just thank them so much for i mean they're giving us they're giving me an idea i mean it's one of the most valuable things i think somebody can offer us but um if you follow this, you can do what works for you. And the answer to anyone that questions that is simply that it wasn't a sustainable service or a sustainable product or offering, and that it wasn't financially viable for your company to continue to operate that way. Um, and when you answer like that, all of a sudden people start seeing you as a business person instead of um, an artist practicing a craft. And so it actually earns you some street cred. Um, so to speak. Okay, next question. I feel like I feel like some of these questions are going to get into math problems. I have a small inventory of physical products, about 100 to 150, but I've only sold about 15 products. I feel stuck. Am I not marketing to the right audience? This too much money for the value? How do I begin to answer these questions and figure out how to get my product in the hands of people who need them? So on this one, I have um, quite a few um, little suggestions. The first thing that I would say is that an inventory of physical products ranging from 100 to 150 is actually um, probably a lot. Um, and that's coming from who had a product catalog of 16,000. Um, that 16,000 was way too big and way too out of control. Um, 100 to 150 sounds like a lot as well. I, I would probably want to know more about the business. But there is an interesting TED Talk video. I will give you the um, link to that in the chat box right now. Um, And this, this TED Talk is by um, an author who's done a ton of research and written a very interesting book called The Paradox of Choice. And he says that choice produces paralysis instead of liberation. So when people become overwhelmed, they choose nothing. And it's going to be different. And, you know, some of us offer one product, some of us offer a variety of services. Um, retail stores, especially brick and mortar stores, might have um, even more products. Um, but there's another interesting experiment. You, you would have to Google it. I think it's called the Jam Experiment, and I didn't get the link um, on that. There's just there's a lot of information out there about it. But a guy did a study where he had people walk into a grocery store and taste test different jams and jellies. And when they taste tested, it was a small number, like three jams or jellies, they always ended up purchasing one. But when he increased the number of options to 16 and asked them to taste test 16, they bought none. So the human brain actually gets to this point where it becomes overwhelmed. And so 
one of the problems, if you do have a variety of pro products in your, in your business, one of the problems you might be experiencing is that people um, have too much to choose from. So that's, that's just a thought, a, a paradigm shift that you might want to look at. Another example I have of this, um, my husband and I started shopping at Aldi a couple years ago. Um, we started shopping there for financial reasons, and we ended up just loving it, so we still shop there. The reason why I love it is because Aldi has one kind of fruit snack. I walk into their store, and for my children, I can, there's only one kind of fruit snack to buy. And the other day, we went to Target. My husband said, run in, get some snacks for the kids for the road. And I walked into Target, and I walked onto the fruit snack aisle, and before me was a shelf of, I swear, 48 different kinds of fruit snacks. And I just thought, oh my word. And I spent 15 minutes in Target on that aisle trying to figure out which type of fruit snack my children were going to prefer. And the reason I like shopping at Aldi now is because it saves me time. And I have so many decisions to make as a business owner to not have to waste my time thinking about what kind of fruit snacks I'm going to buy my kids is a huge time-saving um, tip for me. Um, Here's a note that I wrote in my notes. If you run a retail shop or a brick and mortar shop, you will, of course, have to carry more than one line or more than one product, most likely. But here's my challenge to those of you in this category. Can you sum up your store experience in one word or one feeling or no more than five specific things or feelings? Like, is there a reason people are going to say, I go to this store for this reason? And it might be a feeling. Because an experience is something that you can sell. Even though they're buying physical products, they might want to go to your store um, just, to, just to see what it's like. There's an adorable little store in rural Oklahoma called Harper and & Gray, and it's, it's a destination store. People will travel miles to go to the store because it's so cute and it evokes the feeling of home. Um, and so it's really a lot about what we're talking about tonight in this Q&A is going to be focused and trying to narrow um, all of the things that we're chasing into as entrepreneurs to the things that work best um, for us. Um, another, and I, and I don't mean to, to beat the choice thing to death, but um, another interesting story I have to share with you guys um, is when I was running my wholesale company and we exhibited at the National Stationery Show, um, at one point in time, we expanded beyond our original flagship brand. The original brand was Whitney English, and um, we did subsequent brands under an umbrella that we called English Paper Company. And when I started English Paper Company, I thought, great, if people are going to buy $100 worth of product from Whitney English, a $100 worth of product from every other company in our booth. And if we have 10 other companies in our booth, we just turned a $100 sale into a $1,000 sale. But it actually backfired. It didn't work. And what I learned in that experience is that people in their mind have an idea, at least wholesale buyers, I feel like have an idea about how much they're going to spend at a trade show. And when they walk into a booth, they have a budget per booth. And our sales actually did not increase because of the um, number of brands that we introduced. Um, so just I'm trying to give you guys some experience. So for those of you that can relate to that story, hopefully um, that helps a little bit. Um, oh, Chris Austin, she has the Jam Experiment official title. Thank you. When choice is demotivating, can one desire too much of we'll Google that. And Rachel has her focus to be the delight in someone's day. I love that. That's beautiful. Okay, next question. I love the information and deep dive that module one and module two provide, but I'm having difficulty seeing them together to determine the next best step for my business. So, and in module one, the most important thing that you can walk away with, if you, if you want to summarize that and really get to a focus and speed through the course, um, the most important thing is a top five values or principles. We will use those top five values and principles um, later on in the module about branding. And I'll ask you to kind of pull those um, up then. 
Um, in module two, the most important thing you can walk away with is what kind of model best suits your working style. And this is more about lifestyle choice. Um, one of the questions later on in the, in the module is, I have a family, how do I balance family and business? So we'll talk a little bit more about that there. Um, but you thinking about what type of model you need, if you have a brick and mortar storefront, you're gonna need employees. If you run a really big e-commerce shop, you're gonna need employees. Um, if you're to be a freelancer and do it all yourself, maybe you can um, hire other contractors and contract work out. Um, there's lots of different ways to do that with Elance and Odesk, and I think we talked about Fiverr on the last call. Um, but um, that's what I want you to walk away with in, in module two. So if the pieces don't feel like they're falling all together just yet, um, hang on. We will um, pull, we'll use some of the information that you're uncovering right now in the, in the branding module for sure. Yes, I said Elance. Um, so Elance and Odesk and Fiverr are different um, websites where you can go post jobs and hire hire contractors. Um, so like a graphic designer and that uh, maybe struggles with coming up with logo Fiverr and five dollars and a lot of the work there is international, but people will do logos for really cheap. It's not something I would advise you to do. If, I would not advise anyone to get their brand low off of Fiverr, but I'm all about being resourceful and using different um, things like that whenever I feel stuck, um, at least creatively. Okay, Sarah says Elance uh, merged with another network and it's called Upwork or Odesk. Okay. So the next question is, I love the idea of going back and starting at the foundation of my business, but I feel like I'm already knee deep. How do I pause what I'm currently doing so I can work on my business correctly? I don't want to just start completely over and get I've already built, although sometimes I feel like that would be easy crumbling because I didn't put enough focus on the foundation from the beginning. So I don't know who submitted this question because these are anonymous unless you type your name in there. Um, but I would love, to, whoever submitted this question, I would actually love to talk to you a little bit more about your situation. So if this is you, shoot me an email. Um, so, but, but just to answer the question with some broad brush strokes, um, the first thing I would encourage you to do is don't feel like you have to do this all at one time. Um, maybe one stone at a time. One stepping stone, one turn, one turn one stone over at a time, and fix it and move to the next thing. Eliminate what's not working. Don't be afraid to kill it. And prepare yourself for those people that would be disappointed, and do what's right for your business. That's the biggest piece of encouragement I can give you. If you have somebody that's working with you and you just know that they're not going to float for the long haul, um, graciously as you can, remove that situation um, from from your mind, just so you don't have to worry about it. Um, and then little by little, replace replace it with the things that do work. Um, it's completely and totally fine for your brand to evolve. Now, the one piece of information I have to say, if you're feeling stuck and you feel like you're at this point, there, it, there does come a point in time if your business is not financially viable anymore, if you have lost the will or the interest um, to continue to run it, um, or if, if the product or service that you're selling has ceased to be in demand, which is definitely one of the things that happened with my last business, um, if any of those things or all of those things might be a factor, then you might be at a point where the wisest thing you could do is kill it because you can't, you can't bail out the Titanic with a Dixie cup. I had this ex-boyfriend one time and he described his job like that. He said, I feel like I'm working at a company and I am trying to bail the, the Titanic out with a Dixie cup. And so at some point in time, there, there does come a point where you have to say, I can't just kill the prints that aren't working. I actually need to, to kill the business and start over. So again, if this is your question, I'd love to hear from you and help you. 
um, if I can. Okay, next question. As a visionary ideator with a, without a team right now, how do I get my head out of the clouds long enough to lay a solid foundation and start? I'm always thinking about the end result and it literally distracts me from the now. So I love it. You sound like a daydreamer, me and some of my friends. So the first thing that I would recommend and that you do is put a backwards plan in place. Write down the end goal that you have a very clear idea about and then look, get a piece of paper, write it down and then, and then look at that and say, okay, what is the thing that has to happen right before I reach that goal? And then write that thing down. And then say, okay, what is the thing or what are the things? You could kind of start to mind map this if you needed to that need to happen before I reach that second to the last goal and then write those things down. And just continue to do that and force yourself. It's actually a really challenging exercise, um, but force yourself to continue to back into that um, and keep that in your notes um, with all of your course material because when we, we get to creating the to-do list for your company, you might want to pull that out and reference it. So that's the first thing that I would recommend. And then the second thing I would recommend is find people who can help you focus. Um, I, love, I love that you were willing to admit this, whoever you are, um, <laughs> but um, you know, I think for me, one of the things that's helped get my head out of the clouds is surrounding myself with people who can burst my bubble at times. Um, I know I can't live with my head in the clouds, and I know that's not a really healthy place to be. Um, I, I, in terms of the team that I try to, that try to put around me, I try to um, hire people that at least understand that's who I am and don't try to change that. I don't think you should try to um, tell people that you're, you need, I don't, people shouldn't tell you that you need to get your head out of the clouds or you need to be fixed. You're not, you're not broken. Um, you just need to surround yourself with people who are detailed people. And sometimes these can just be friends. I mean, find, find some, some cocktail entrepreneurs in your area and, and people who will give you honest feedback. And I know that those people are hard to find over the years. So when you do find them, oh my gosh, keep them around you. Um, if you find another entrepreneur who can um, hug you and tell you when you're doing something wrong, um, it's going to be a huge asset. Those of you that have been in business for a while, I know you know that. Um, but those of you who are just starting out, um, you'll find a lot of um, great mentorship out there. And I would just encourage you to not burn your bridges. I've seen that happen to a detriment of some companies before. Okay, next question. Am I am I getting um Okay, so Mickey made a great point when we were talking about killing things. She said how long would you typically give a new initiative to gain momentum and generate revenue before you decide to kill it? I think I'm going to answer that in a question later on, Mickey. And if I don't, let me know. Um, okay, next question. How do you balance the, how do you balance between juggling a business that offers products and services? Is it confusing when it comes to marketing efforts? How do you make it clear to the client? So great question. In the next module, we will talk a little bit about this issue. We're going to talk a lot about customers and clients in the next, um, the next section, next module. But it can be very confusing for a client um, to be offered multiple products and services. And if you do products and services, you need to have a really clear funnel. We're going to talk about funnels um, shortly as well. But you need to have a very clear um, system that steps people through um, determining if that product or service is right for them. Another thing on this is you, you have to kind of be prepared to lose people. So I've heard it described, I've heard of, I've heard it described as um, um, like a, a sieve or a strainer 
Um, and every time you shake that sieve or that strainer, you, you lose a little bit of the contents of what's in it, if it's water or you know, sand or whatever, um, until you're left with the, the people that are, that are most interested in your product. And that's kind of the concept of, of a funnel. Um, so anytime you offer multiple products and services, you need to be prepared to have people um, sign up for your email list and then, and then unsubscribe. Don't get offended about it. It just happens. Um, um, and, then, and then you need to be clear that the communication has to be clear. Um, you need to get really clear on um, the features and benefits of every product. You need to make sure your team is really clear on it so they're communicating consistently on those things. Um, you can do this by naming things, giving things a name. I have discovered that, um, especially with intangible, that giving, it's like, you know, writing a book. Books, you know, for more, you know, for all intents and purposes, a book is an intangible product. And it's given a title, and all of a sudden, the title gives it, it meaning. And we did some software development at my last company, and I realized that when I named that piece of software that we were creating, it was an internal piece of software, all of a sudden, my staff embraced it in a completely different way. Um, so naming things for your customers can help, too. And you could get into trademarks with that if you wanted to. Um, you could also consider splitting into two businesses. Um, but here's my word of caution about that. Sometimes two businesses um, means double the work, literally. Sometimes you have two different customers, you have two different websites. Um, so that can be challenging as well. Um, definitely, no matter what, if you are trying to offer two of something, um, I would recommend getting a third-party opinion or feedback, just making sure that what makes sense in your head makes sense to the people that you're trying to sell to as well. Um, so that's that. After, after convenience that I fall into the administrative guru archetype. But I feel like I identify more mediator. I'm not sure if it's because I still have my hands in my business and I'm on the production line wearing all different kinds of hats. Is it possible to fall into two archetypes? Yes, it is. But one thing that I would like to say to all the administrative gurus that have joined us tonight is, um, and that's actually a gift. I mean, it's like there is gift of the administrative guru. And if you are an administrative guru, I hope you see that gift because you can be, you can have all the ideas in the world, but if you can't actually execute on them, you're not going to make progress. And there's an interesting book by a guy named Scott Belsky named Making, it's called Making Ideas Happen. And he basically talks about the, the multiplier that systems and organization are in our lives and our businesses. And we can have a hundred times, we can have a, like, a hundred ounces of creativity, but if we have no ounces of organization, we, a hundred times zero is, is still zero. Um, we can have 50 ounces of creativity and 10 ounces of organization and 50 times 10 is 500. And so the gift of the administrative guru is that organization. Um, this is oftentimes why people who are good at organizing things and running things are sometimes more effective than people who have the best ideas. And so to all the the visionary ideators out there, um, it's the discipline of administrative skills is a constant challenge, um, and that's something that the administrative guru doesn't have to have. So um, don't, um, I, I wouldn't be ashamed of that. Um, one thing that I would say is Make sure that when you when you learn what your entrepreneurial activity style is, um, make sure that you're building your business around that strength. 
Um, for an example, are you helping people for the administrative guru, are you helping people take their lives to the next level in that administrative capacity? If you sell services, this could be as an executive assistant, because you understand how these and marketers work. If you sell products, this could be something like providing a course for people who want to do their own taxes, because as an administrative guru, you're going to know how to do that. You're going to be able to tell other people how to do that. Uh, if you want to sell physical products because you're interested in being a production artist as well, um, this could be something like a book that walks people through um, the technical details of how to set up a website or an email list. So there are lots of ways to look at that administrative strength and say, this is what I'm good at. Now, how do I sell that as a product or service? So that's sort of a way to think about that. Um, I see some questions over here. Um, okay, I'm going to have to catch up on those in a little bit. I'm going to get through all these first. If I can go back, I will. Okay, the next question is, one of my business visions was to create affordable products. How do you create affordable products without losing quality? What and when is the best way to increase your prices? So on this note, I would say um, one thing I would tell you about creating affordable products is that if you're trying to create a premium brand, and maybe not everyone here is, but if you want to create a premium brand, never compete on price. Um, some of you may be familiar with there's the old adage that says you can have it for cheap, pick two, but you can't ever have all three. Um, what I have found as an entrepreneur is that when you try to sell good, fast, and cheap, when you try to have good quality products at an affordable price um, with, a, with a good turnaround time, um, you, in, you're, you literally are trying to do it all. And if you try to do it all, you end up in burnout. That would be my warning flag, um, personal experience warning flag there. Been there, done that. Um, I actually would never recommend to a creative entrepreneur um, I would recommend to maybe non-creative entrepreneurs, but to creative entrepreneurs, I would never ever tell you to compete on price, ever, ever. As a creative, as a, as a creative, you have an art form of some kind in your mind, and that could be an event, because you're an event planner. It could be an idea, because you're a consultant. It could be a product, because you're a production artist. Or it could be even be the beautiful experience of a brick and mortar store, or or an online e-commerce storefront. People will pay for an experience. Look at Disney World. People are paying for an experience. They're paying to feel something. Um, so there's an, there's an interesting blog. A friend of mine named Sean Lowe um, writes a blog called The Business of Being Creative. Um, I'll type this out and post it. And so his website is thebusinessofbeingcreative.com. And Sean is an interesting guy that um, he actually, he actually, he was a business coach for me for about a year. Um, and one of the things he really works with creative entrepreneurs on is honoring your art form. And he taught, his blog talks a lot about that. Um, so anyway, if you're interested in learning more about that, I would recommend that as a resource. As far as when it's time to raise your price, um, the best advice I've heard on that is from Jasmine Starr, who is a wedding photographer, and she says that for every three sessions she booked, she raised her prices $300. And if she got a referral from a different bride, um, you know, six years later, and the bride was like, oh, my friend said that you were only $900, Jasmine said, our skill has increased. She fell back on her expertise. Our skill has increased. Um, we've improved, our portfolio's improved, and our, our prices are, are of value in relation to that experience. So I felt like that was really good advice, and I think it translates to, um, it can translate to anything. It definitely translate to, translates to, to services, um, but if you're, if you're creating an experience and a compelling um, brand that people value, um, there's always an opportunity to, to do that. 
So, okay. Next question, is it okay to have two different service-based revenue streams? designs for wedding stationery and designs for logos, and also sell products? Or do you think I should focus on one to just maximize results? So again, we're kind of back to the concept of focus, and what we've done here is brand confusion. Um, when somebody says, hey, what do you do? Um, you know, what's the answer? Is it 10 seconds, or is it, um, you know, five minutes? Are you, Positioning, and another question I would ask is, are you positioning yourself as an expert by saying, hey, yeah, I do wedding stationery and I do logos and I sell products. Um, you want to position yourself, in order to create a premium brand, you want to position yourself as an expert. Um, so I would, I would highly recommend focus. Um, what I can say is that if you're just starting out, I do think it's fine to try on all these different hats until you see which one is outperforming the others. Have an e-commerce shop. Maybe you do need to sell a lot of products until you figure out the one that creates a connection with your customer um, and makes them want to come back or tell their friends. Uh, know which product that is and it's going to be the product that's profitable it's going to be the product that's in demand people actually want it and it's going to be the product that you're going to be able to sustain an interest in over the long haul so um, probably not a commodity but I don't think we're talking about commodity products in this course um, you to figure out what that product is then one by one you need to kill the products or services or offerings that are making the least amount of money. Um, there's the 80-20 rule, and the 80-20 rule applies to killing things, and that's, you know, this, that's simply look at the entire list of SKUs and the items that aren't selling, the 20% at the bottom of that spreadsheet, you could scratch them off every single year and probably never, never look back. It's, otherwise, you sort of end up carrying um, dead weight and i can i can dive more into that um i feel like that's kind of a theme for this module so y'all let me know if you need me to do that um next question i would love to know more about how to fill out the second pricing sheet so today we posted a video um with an in-depth explanation and walkthrough on filling out that budget worksheet so it is on the budget module Okay, next question. I've not started a business yet and I am using this course to give me a starting point. How can I use the information to help me start up? Most people have either, it, it seems like most people here have either established businesses or brand new businesses. What should I be looking for to get me to a point of starting? So um, actually for any business here, not just for any a business that, that's starting out, um, I would tell you that on branding, you need to know your top five values. You're, you don't want your customers to be confused about the emotion or the experience they are going to have when they need to come into contact with you. And the best way to do that is to get really clear on those values. Stick to the, those values like glue, memorize them, make sure they're authentically you and not something that you want to be. Make sure they're something that you you can practice without much effort um, and it's not a performance for you because you'll get exhausted that way. Um, clear on what you want to sell and how you want to sell it. You can, you can definitely try things out if you're just starting out, like I just said. Um, we do have some people coming at um, a financial advisor and a lawyer and we're going to get some advice from them on how to start and my financial advisor, Mills, is also going to talk to us about um, investment. So for those of us who've been in business a little bit longer, um, different things that we need to be doing with our money to make sure that we're being good stewards. And the other thing that I would encourage you, um, not just if you're starting out, but if you're feeling stuck, is to keep asking questions. Keep asking questions here. Um, 
it's really hard to answer the question, hey, how do I get started? Um, you know, you know that there are legal aspects of getting started, you know there are financial aspects of getting started, um, and just keep asking those questions um, and never stop. That's the best way I've found to learn. Okay, next question is, I'm working long hours without much financial reward. Um, this is making staying motivated hard. I want my time away from my family to contribute to a better life with them, and I want my creativity to lead to a better outcome. So for anyone that's feeling torn between work and family, I would really encourage you to start with lifestyle first and then look at business. Don't look for a business that you think is going to be profitable and make you money, and then try to work in family around that. Put family first, and then look at all the business models that we've talked and figure out if there's a model in there that interests you that you can either evolve your business to or maybe something you can start. And again, grain of salt, you don't want to get too distracted if your current business is making money, um, but something that you can, you can do that way. Um, okay, next question. How do I manage two different business models? Very carefully. So two different business models um, will, will honestly take twice as much time. There's really not an economies of scale in running two businesses. At least I have not figured that out. Um, and as an owner of many businesses, um, I have to be careful about my, um, and if, if an opportunity is not going to directly impact the bottom line, um, it's really hard to say yes to that opportunity. Um, there are all kinds of, there are, there are definitely all kinds of dangers, um, about running two business models. Um, I don't want to say it can't, can't be done, um, but sometimes you're managing two different customer bases, which means you're managing two different email lists, which man means you're managing two different types of content, content creation, two different types of um, messaging. Um, and it gets really complicated and stuff starts to slide and you it becomes harder to do um, all of that really well. If you are the best delegator in the whole wide world, it is probably completely possible. Um, to do that, but I just don't know that I have ever seen anybody do it really well for a long period of time. Not, I mean, none of my friends, I don't think. I know, I mean, I know there are people that do it, but um, I mean, I have a friend that owns an insurance company and a medical sales business. Um, but for creative entrepreneurs, we're more hands-on and it's hard for us to do that. Okay, next question. I have too many ideas and none have ever been implemented. Over the years, I have had an idea and seen other people um, take that idea and then they make a profitable business and I am still stuck at levels one and two. Okay, I totally understand. And there are probably a bunch of us that could put our hands and say, yeah, me too. And the one thing I have to say, this is probably, I'm probably talking to a visionary ideator who, who struggles with that administrative skill set. And that, that is a discipline. I said this earlier. That's a discipline that I've had to learn how to practice over the years. And there's still days where I get up and I think I've got to find coffee. Um, I was at a Donald Miller conference one time and they said, how do you, how do, you do it? And he said, whiskey and Adderall. And I was like, oh my gosh, <laughs> this is terrible. Um, but, you know, sometimes you just have to put one foot in there and get it done. I was teaching my son how to ride a bike earlier this week. And he was really struggling with steering the front wheel and keeping his balance. And finally, I just said, I, I picked something on the horizon. And I said, look at, look at that red rose bush. Like, look at the red flowers. Don't take your eyes off the flowers. And all of a sudden, he started pedaling. He started making progress. He quit looking at the pedals. He quit looking at the wheel on his bike. And he started going somewhere. 
And that's the gift of the visionary idea. You see that red rose bush, that red flower bush up ahead, and you can you can point the bike towards it and you can just go. Um, so definitely there's a balance there, but I would encourage you to find that focus, find that, find that thing on the horizon and just put two feet on the floor every morning and start working towards that. Okay, next question. Um, order of events, should the website and online presence and blog be up before the products are ready or should the products be done and then the work um, online in one piece? Um, this, is a, this is a just getting started question. Again, um, the, the first thing I would recommend anyone to do, and for existing businesses, I can't tell you how many times I look at a website um, and we're going to do website critiques, by the way. If you're interested in having um, a, a gentle and loving critique of your website done in one of the later modules, let us know. Um, and we, we're going to be using your websites as examples. Um, but the first thing any business needs on their website is a place to accept email addresses. Um, and there's so many websites that don't have that or it's not necessarily in the best spot on the website. Um, to give you guys an example, um, I have a friend who approached me a couple months ago. I used to have a product line called Trendy Totes at my last company and it, it became a bright and shiny object. It was a, an idea that I felt like was going to be viable, but um, I just never had time to really implement it. And she came to me and said, what if I started that back up? And I said, awesome, have it. Here are all the designs, here are the patterns, um, run with it. So she came to me and asked me to coach her basically from beginning to end on starting the business. So if you are interested, and I, I think it would be interesting, especially for those of you that are starting out or even people that have an established business, um, you know, times have evolved, marketing has evolved, things like that. Um, you can actually go follow what she's doing, um, her, her website is trendytotes.com, um, and trendy was with an E, like TR, you know, I can just type it. Um, so she's got her email sign up on that website, no products yet, um, and then on Instagram, um, she's doing some stuff over there. So, um, that a study for me. <laughs> okay. Um, someone asked a social media question. What do I focus on first? Facebook and Instagram, then YouTube, or which one first? A um, little bit of information on that. I think social media can be totally overwhelming. I don't think you have to be on every channel. I think you need to be on the channels that work for you. And I think you need to be on the channels that work for your audience and your customer base. Um, a great read on that is there's a guy named I'm going to butcher the last name. People call him Gary V. Gary Vaynerchuk. Did I say that right? Um, he wrote a book called Crush It a few years ago. It's a short little read. Um, if you really want to wrap your mind around um, just kind of the concept of interacting with social media audience, I'd read that. But I, I don't by any stretch of the imagination recommend that you feel like you need to map every social media channel. And when we get to um, the final module, we will talk a lot about um, one of the lessons I have is me just sitting there giving you every single Instagram secret I know. Kind of funny. Um, so when we get to that, I think you guys, um, whoever asked that question, I think you'll like that. Okay, next question is, I have no clue where to go next. I launched and I have four products I love. I know I can dig deeper for more meaning in these products. I created them out of my passions, not my strength, question mark. Um, I'm completely stuck on how to sell these products and where to go from here. What should I do there is to focus on taking this course and come up with a game plan? I hope a lot of these questions will be answered throughout the course as I learn. Yes, I mean, definitely they're going to. There's, we're covering so much content in this course that we're not going to get through it without um, answering questions or, um, you know, helping you implement this, no matter what phase of business you're in. I love that 
I ever asked this question, I love that you're digging deep and you're adding meaning to your butt eggs. So um, even for people that um, resell other people's products, it's even the descriptions that you're on your your website um, can can add meaning to things, and it's really important. Um, tell people, you know, if you if you're a wholesale buyer and you curate um, a retail store, tell people why you picked out the candles or um, that little home decor, and it, it doesn't have to be um, a major earth shattering reason. The word because is actually a really important word in copywriting. Um, and when you give people a reason, it helps them understand what you're trying to communicate. So did you pick out those candles because they remind you of um, the cinnamon rolls that your grandma used to cook on Saturday morning? People are going to go, oh, I love that. I love cinnamon rolls. Thank you. Um, so that's just a way of adding meaning to your products, if an example, if it's not products that you create. If you do create the product, tell people by why you, tell people why you created them. Um, if you've got four though, and you're trying to figure out how to sell them, one thing I would say is start by trying to sell maybe one, but not four. Um, back to that focus concept, we will definitely go in depth into the five different levels of business in the final module and get lists um, to do lists that everyone can do at each level. You can go back into level one and make sure you've crossed off all those. Um, those things and then continue to move forward. Um, but this, I, if you try to go and do those things without first having a clear idea about what you're trying to build and a clear idea about who you are, which we've discussed in module one and two, um, you end up in that scattered and burnt out spot. Um, so yeah, just go back to the focus. So try to sell one product. Um, try to sell it well, try to sell through it, try to sell out of it, set a goal, um, try to help people are relating to that one product and how they're connecting with it and try to make it a great experience and then and then figure out how to move on to the, the next. So that might, you might need a more, whoever asked that question, you might need a more in-depth answer and feel free to let me know. Um, Okay, we're almost through. So this, yeah, this is the final one. Is it because I'm too close to the center that I feel like I'm having a hard time getting to the bottom of my foundation? I feel like I know some of the answers, but others are still unclear to me. So one thing that I tell people, especially if this is the first time you're going through stuff, if, if you've been through something like this before, um, and you know, I don't know anything else out there like that, but if, if some of it feels like old hat, it's a good time to, to reevaluate. This is stuff that as business evolves, as technology evolves, as you personally grow and evolve, um, you know, going back to your core and making sure that it aligns with your business is really important. I think as creative entrepreneurs, we're kind of like tornadoes. And I'm from Oklahoma, and a tornado picks up everything in its path. And as it moves forward, it starts to cast those things out of the tornado. And when you're first starting out, it's very tempting to, to pick up everything in the past. It's really tempting to um, say, I'm going to offer a product. I'm going to offer a service. I'm going to offer this. I'm going to wear this hat. I'm going to be an administrator. I'm going to be on the, you know, do all these things. Um, and then as you grow on, as you, as you grow and move on, you start to figure out what doesn't fit. And you can throw those things out and start to really focus on only what does fit. Um, the purpose of module two is really twofold, and that is one, to help you realize what you're good at. Even if you can't hire out what you're not good at, you can still sell what you are good at. You follow me? Um, that's the easy stuff. The second purpose of module two is to help give you an idea and also to create a conversation around what you should be focused on. And I think, back to that focus word, I think that's what I've been hearing from people um, on this. And the primary here is that you have to focus on um, what, what makes you money 
And until you figure out what that is, you are trying on all the hats to figure out what that thing is. Um, and as soon as you try on the hat that not only makes you the most money, but is um, profitable, in demand, and something that you can sustain an interest in long term, back to those three things, kind of a recurring theme on this call, um, you can throw out us and focus focus on that. And I think that's when you have to become a student of business and entrepreneurship and not just a student of the interest that got you into that business in the first place. Because things kind of shift at that point. So if you're if you're at the starting out point, you're still trying to figure out what works. But if you're further along, it's you're not really studying, you know, what people are buying. You're really studying business and entrepreneurship from other entrepreneurs and business people to figure out how to get to the next level. Um, I think that's all my questions. Yep. That's it. I mean, there was um, of questions on on the Q and A. What there are a lot of other questions in the comments right now, and I am going to have to. So some people have asked for critiques. Um, I will ask again. Um, I'll probably send out a an email link or a form, or we'll actually do that as one of the the final um, final videos or final webinars. Okay, I'm trying to figure out if there are any questions in here that I can answer right now. We're at we're at an hour exactly, and I really want to respect everyone's time. So if you guys have qu the questions that you've asked here, if I haven't been able to answer them, um, submit them on that questions form, um, and we will tackle them in the next Q and A call, um, or or post them in the forum, or hop over to the forums right now um, and post any questions if any of you guys want to continue. Um, the conversation. But thank you all so much for such a great question. I mean, you're really diving into this stuff, and I'm really excited about Module 3. Um, we're going to start, basically start walking through these systems in depth, trying to get you guys as much information as we can about um, different platforms and things that um, you need, different resources and tools that you can use to build your business. Um, to strengthen each of the seven systems that we've been that we started talking about in the launch videos, and um, and implement those systems if you who haven't implemented them yet too. So thank you, thank you, thank you. Have a great evening, and I will see you guys around.